the first three weeks of the eruption here in Hawaii, crazy things would happen in the middle of the night. A new fissure would open up and it would threaten a new neighborhood. Thousands of people were evacuated from their homes. I started the Hawaii Tracker Facebook group to help people understand what's going on and get their questions answered. Hey, how's it going? We're live. This is Fissure 20. We had hundreds of people all throughout the neighborhoods sending in videos and articles and images. We spent a lot of time making sure the accurate information gets out. This is live, it's still lava moving. They weren't just sharing a story, they were helping their neighbor. If a family was being evacuated, a group would just jump in and help out. So it was huge. They were watching out for each other. Hello everybody, thank you for coming. Thank you for the support from everybody. As we go through this, we're growing closer together as a community. When tragedies like this strike, you really realize how much you need each other. Uh, aloha everybody, I'm geologist Philip Ong, here with Mr. Dane DuPont, hawaiitracker.com, to bring you guys another Kilauea volcano update, and a bonus Mauna Loa update today as well. On Tuesday, March 30th, 2021, this is the 100th day of Kilauea's 2020-2021 eruption. So we're going to talk about what's essentially only subtle changes in a volcano. Uh, here's our west vent you can see right here, this is the area that's built up when lava was was coming out at a higher rate and recently only coming out of this double entry down here at the bottom. So some subtle changes around the vent area, some subtle changes in the lake margin, we'll talk about those. Uh, the lava lake depth has remained unchanged at 224 meters, 735 feet. There's been a small deflation inflation cycle, really pretty small in duration and in amplitude compared to the ones we've had recently. So that's interesting, and regardless of, of what's been essentially higher pressure or more stable pressure, the SO2 has been trending down, and now we're down to in the range of 650 below 600, maybe around 580 tons per day. So low eruption rates, we'll, we'll finish our, our, our presentation today with a little bonus and analysis of the eruption rates based on USGS uh, daily updates and their maps. Um, but we're also going to talk about Mauna Loa in between there, and because of Mauna Loa, there have been... Uh, a cluster of earthquakes that have happened northwest of the summit and it's issued a USGS statement. The bottom line is no increased eruption imminence there, um, but we'll discuss it and show you guys all details of that as well because it will be coming across social media for sure. 
All right, so that's that's what we got for you guys today. So our first view here is a view of a lava lake on March 27th, so just a few days ago. And I wanted to zoom in here and look at this vent area first. And maybe what you guys can see in this vent area, if I point it out, is you see all this bright area. Let me get a better color here. See all this bright area over here. And that usually indicates increased flow. It's flowing a little faster there than some of the other areas. So this is that new overflow pathway from the west vent where it had burst open from its northeast vent and flowed down and made that perch pond up in here and then it overflowed and burst out and pressed it over and that essentially gave us a pathway. The lava is now following some way from up there through the west vent. And the original path was a little bit more this way and since then it seems to have been maybe petering out. Um, what I want to really point out here is if you look closely there's, there's only a small area that appears to be coming directly from over here and at least at the time this photograph is taken and a much larger area over here so possibly that lava is finding it easier to come out of this part of the west vent this this northern northern branch of it for whatever reason and whether whether that's coincident or not this this tilted love island over here that's now forming part of the berm is somewhat in the way of where that original entry point was. So it's kind of interesting to think about what would be happening behind here or what was blocked off or what, what this might be doing to that entry point right over there. So we'll watch and see. It's, it's hard to really tell unless you have these high resolution photographs and we only have one every once in a while, which is fantastic. I'm not complaining. But if we had high res video of this all the time, then we could show you guys a much better story of what's actually going on there. So we'll have to wait for those videos be analyzed and published and worked back in due time when it does happen. So that's one minor change, one subtle change here in event. You see there's still some little islets. There's a small one over here and a bigger one over here that kind of lines up with the end, the point of this Love Island, Love Island Peninsula now. It's sticking out. So the other minor change has got to do with this little bay over here. I'm not sure what to call it. This is on kind of a west southwest end here and it's it's like a little bay that's now made by this peninsula that's sticking out and it seems like in here you still see there's crust overturning the lava is still moving in there and it's still building up but it seems to be acting a little bit different in this region than that is in other parts of the lava lake so maybe this might be where it stagnates and closes off if the lava levels stay stay dropping or if the gas levels continue to drop and we're getting gooier and gooier lava so this is that's the kind of subtle thing that's going on in the grand scheme of things. It's, there's not been a whole lot of change. Lava still going in pretty steady. Um, I should note though that uh, this original photograph here, March 27, Kilauea, uh, Matt Patrick uh, photograph, does describe the steep levee on most of the sides of the lava lake over here. It does describe the lava lake only in this active western section. There's a second photograph is what I'm looking for the caption here. Let me, let me get to it. Zoom out here. The second photograph says the close-up of the inlet where the lava from the western fissure feeds into the lava lake in Hale Mau Mau at the summit of Kilauea. The lava stream was sluggish with a movement barely perceptible with a naked eye. So I thought that was noteworthy to relay and barely perceptible with a naked eye, it's moving really slow. So we'll show you guys time lapses and everything looks like it's moving really quickly, but you have to remember it's all really sped up and it's really important to have that first hand observation from um, HBO scientists to really tell us that, yeah, that it's really going so slow you can barely see it moving. So that's another sign of the slow, slow, sluggish, low eruption rate. In this particular photograph right here, the reason I had it zoomed in is I'm looking at this double, double entry, I still see quite a bit of lava coming out from this area and it's not really clear how much is coming out over here at all. Surely it still is, it's just getting crusted over and that, it, this crust forms and breaks away and forms and breaks, breaks away. We'll show you guys that in a time lapse here shortly as well. So let's see if that is what's next here. So we'll start off with the USGS last 24 hours. Automatically generated time lapse. And then zoom in here. So in the last 24 hours, you can see a couple of hot spots from the top of the west vent putting out gas still. You see 
looking from the north. So our, our previous point of view was in the opposite direction, looking that way, right? North is over here. North. And that double entry is right in here, and that cone above it is where we see these two, two glowing hose, holes that are putting out the gas. Here's that little peninsula, that Love Island pen peninsula. And that eyelet that lines up with it over here. Small one is right in the middle. And there's a couple other ones that are more in the center and more towards the north here. And all the way around we have this built up perched edge of the lava lake. And it seems like in most places, I don't have to try to zoom in more, in most places the crust seems to move under or past or however whatever action it has it's it's getting past this boundary that's raised above and it's going under that crust and the evidence for that is that we are occasionally still seeing bursts like we see here on the right of lava coming up on on this gap at the edge of the crater that's something we've been seeing for quite a while so what i've done here is compile out a time lapse that spans the last week or so. And I've got a little montage of different different things here. So start off with an overall view. The last week sped up. So you see we have these uh, flows up through the, the, the gap at the edge of the crater. You see one, two, and then the third one I pointed out to you guys just now, three in the course of a week. So not super frequent, but they are happening. And otherwise you'll see quite a lot of convection very normal activity from most of the lava lake, unchanging all through there. And we're going to zoom into this area over here, this little bay, and get a closer look at it to see what kind of activity we can see there. So here it is. Here's that bay zoomed in. And I want to look at the difference between an area like this at the top of the view, where you just see that orange just going past that blue continuously, continuously. Whereas down here in the bottom, it seems like it pulses some more. Once in a while, you see it all becomes solid. It's almost like it's lapping up and on to a shallower area, which is interesting, right? Maybe it's becoming shallower because we have Love Island tipped over that's forming a peninsula, and now maybe some of that crust, or, or maybe that's a, allowing some of that sluggish lava to stick to it and cool to it and grow that that lava, that kind of semi-solid piece, piece of material there that's, that's a little islet at the top now becoming a peninsula and maybe shallowing down there. So that's interesting to watch and consider what might be happening, especially in light of what we saw uh, with that 1921 activity, right? So this last few here, we're just looking at this island. This thing's still moving, this thing's still moving, and this thing's still moving. I've kind of looped it a few times and gone really fast just so we can make sure we can just note those things. These are not rooted that piece or that piece or that piece. So that's what we have there with the F1 thermal time-lapse camera from the USGS and that is thanks to Bob Martin compiling images um, from the USGS. So mahalo everybody involved there. All right. We're going to switch now to the S1 camera. So this is, a, this is that same view from the south. North is now back over here. This is a similar view to the first image we started off with you guys, except it's not quite, in high, quite as high a resolution here. So we'll play it similar kind of thing the last week. And mostly activity normal within the lava lake. You see the bursts on a far greater wall over here at the rim of the, of the lava crust. And otherwise, this whole area is all cooled. You can see the topographies on there is unchanging for the most part. The whole thing is rising up. So we'll zoom in here once again on the whole lava lake and go through it kind of fast once again. You can see the islands bobbing around, little islets. And then here is that bay. And then here, this is a section where maybe we see some little bit different pattern, right? It looks like it's lapping up and down more right in there. So finished going through. Even the movement of the crust is much more jerky. And even if it's coming out sluggishly from this west vent, it's still continuous. Whereas it's kind of jerky over here. Interesting to see. Possibly that would be the next area that closes off as this lava lake surface continues to shrink. So lava lake surfaces 
active lava surface is at at uh, its low again, um, down to I believe eight acres or so. So it's, uh, it's we'll show you guys that how that's trended over time as well. Okay, that's one camera, HVO, last twenty four hours automatic. There it is. And because it does flicker between a nighttime and a daytime, and it can be a little off-putting, I'll, I'll scroll up here to the still current image that we have. And you guys can see what that view looks like. Still, same situation going on there. A little bit of that crust right in there. Yeah. The thing I didn't point out in this other time lapse was that, that crust breaking apart. But that seems to be what's happening. It seems to form a little bit of a crust around that nozzle, and then it breaks apart and drifts away. And it seems to be keeping itself fairly open at the double entry point. That's the S1 camera. So interesting to see all the, topog all the topography in area, all these different different basins, different elevations, a little bit lower, one a little bit lower than the other, high points in the middle, and s several different islets, and maybe some mush that someone might have once called epimagma. You know, got more of like a... a, a, a a stickier, less gassy um, version texture of the lava. That's more more craggy and um, doesn't have that fine of a structure within it. Right. So kind of a, interesting to see if, if we'll see that that coming up. And I always wanted to point out, kind of, if you haven't seen our 1921 presentation 100 years ago, to go and see that. But one thing to that that I want to tie to today is you look, look at the configuration of these ponds 100 years ago. And you can see we have a lot of these are right at that edge of the of the lava lake of the crater, like right at the edge of the crater, right at the edge of the crater. There is a central, but for the most part, all of these are all at the edge of the crater. And if I scroll down and zoom in a little more, you can see that on their cross sections, they actually indicate that there's pathways. The deeper pathways seem to be sometimes near the edges. Depends on which cut you have. So this is the one view and of course it changes all the time because this whole all this material in the middle is semi-solid and, and can deform plastically without actually breaking right it's kind of like a silly putty almost you know it can still flow but it's much harder um, sometimes you have you have uh, tunnels that are essentially rings around the outside of the crater as you see in the cross section shown over here sometimes you have a pathway that comes up through the middle perhaps as well but also you still have a pathway coming up in a corner and even to the point where when you have some slumping collapsing they're still showing pathways of magma that can squeeze up in that crack right in the edge and it's interesting that we see that that activity of lava coming up in the edges of the cracks and I'm just going to tie that back in back into you guys who have been following us and saw that presentation there let's turn to some data here in Kilauea and we will get to Mauna Loa, but Kilauea first, uh, the data part of it. This is the most recent one month of tilt at Uwekuhuna, Kilauea Summit. And I'm showing you guys this one first because this is the one that's the, the easiest compare our more recent, most recent deflation inflation event, which is this one over here, to the one we had, for example, uh, a week and a half ago or so. And so that, that one much bigger amplitude you can see was in a, in a range of five to six microradians the one we had just a few days ago is on a, on a range of two microradians or so maybe two and a half maybe three microradians or so so quite a bit smaller seems like it was pretty short as well some of these can last quite a while just because of the the, the distance they drop and how long that takes to happen so it didn't drop for quite as long and came back up came back up sooner essentially that's what we see there and i can zoom in a little better for you guys a little better comparison there more recent ones so this is what happened in the last week overall it's been fairly stable high pressure the pressure hasn't if we take the tilt as a proxy for the swelling of the volcano and the pressure inside of it then we're not seeing it any big change here within the last about 10 days or so, right? It's noteworthy if you look at the last big deflation inflation. By by about the turn of the date on the 19th, we're coming out of it. So the 19th, 20th, that's a noteworthy time as we look at, look at some of the other data, especially the gas, and try to try to correlate how it might be varying, right? Because before we've noticed how some of the gas values seem to drop during these bigger deflation inflation events. 
Um, but we're seeing now the gas values are dropping and we're not seeing a big deflation inflation plan. We're seeing a little one, but we're seeing overall the tilt showing a fairly stable level, only varying back and forth two or three micro radians. Right, let's go to the main USGS kiloway deformation page. Here it is. Last two days here is this first plot at the top. The whole scale from top to bottom goes from positive one to minus one, two micro radians right there coming out of the bottom of this deflation inflation. So the scale is really blown up. It's hard to tell what that is in context. Here it is for the last week. You can see it a little bit better zoomed in. And the same thing, you can see that two and a half. And it goes from about one up there to minus 1.5, two and a half micro radian uh, deflation inflation cycle, which is a normal depressurization, repressurization of the volcano that we've described before. Um, if you guys haven't caught any of those earlier updates, it's some movement of denser magma down some some narrow pathway that has to move first and essentially blocks the fresher lava from coming up. And then once it's out of the way, the fresher magma comes and reinflates back up and resumes its original pathway. So here's a past month month automatic plot, and we still have this green POO station, and it's showing us. Uh, something in the order of 100 microradians of offset before flat lines, and it seems like this is some um, compromised station down here. And in that scale, you really don't see much of anything over here, which is why I showed you guys the other one first. And that is our tilt. Our GPS. I'm going to zoom into this over here. Here's our scale of the eruption. The initial build up where we're spreading distance across a caldera. This is a cross caldera distance GPS plot. And then it contracts as the relief of the first few days of eruption, first week of eruption, uh, allows the ground to, to relax. And ever since then, it's been an upward trajectory with variations that have been, at some points, fairly, fairly large that seem to correspond to the larger deflation inflation events that last days as well on a volcano. Overall, you do see that kind of pattern like that. Here at the end, it's starting to look a little bit different, and these GPS plots are always very tricky to read, and it's always there's always a caveat to try not to do it, to, to read too much into it. But all the caveat said, it does appear that there could be a slightly different trend here. And I've noted that we didn't have a, a big deflation event since the 19th. And that's about 10 days ago, so that's, that's not what this is right here. That last big deflation event was was in this area over here, and since then we've been flat, possibly slightly down. That's interesting to see what's going what's happening here and what could be influencing this signal. No answers for you guys. Just pointing out a little interesting, interesting trend there, right? We've been looking at at, at the signal and saying that, the, that it's hard for the eruption to come to a close unless you have two separate things happening inside of it at the same time. You see it, everything is still spreading. So it's interesting to think about, about whether there is something that's that's arresting that spreading, it's relieving the spreading, or whatever is going on there. All right, that's the GPS. This is the text update from USGS, this is where all this information is coming from. We are still at 224 meters, 735 feet deep and stagnant on the eastern half. SO2 rates elevated at 650 tons per day last measured March 26 is what the update as of 8.30 this morning says. The only other noteworthy thing on here is that finally again today, after all of the last week, we see the return of this statement to our East Rifts and observations that monitors indicate that the, sum that the summit and upper East Rift zone between a summit and Pu'o'o is refilling at rates similar to those measured over the past two years and before the December 2020 eruption. So that's kind of the background of what the volcano does. It fills with magma. Right? I've sometimes used it's not, not, not the greatest analogy, but it is, is an analogy to relate the volcano to a living being and its, its rift zones to arteries that, you know, in that sense, the magma is like its blood, right? So it has to flow even if it's not spurting out anywhere. It still has to, has to flow through the system to maintain the volcano. So nothing to worry about, but not worthy that there that that is reemerged here on the text update. We'll look at the past month lava lake depth here, zoomed in. Instead of showing you guys that whole um, whole, whole eruption, we'll show you guys just the last month here. 
still have to ignore this scatter that comes with a, the foggy or rainy weather. And you can see that we're between 220 and 230 meters and barely flatlined here on the right over the last little while here, right? The, the, the 19th. By the end of the 19th, we're coming out of our deflation inflation. That was the last little dip we had when it went down. And we've kind of come up and up a little bit and it's wiggled and wiggled and wiggled a little bit. And really, it's been fairly, fairly stable. Coming up, coming up, coming up, slowly but surely. Um, but not a whole lot of change and no change uh, within the last week. So that's the last month of the Lava Lake. We'll keep scrolling down on this last month USGS page. And we'll just take a quick look at the seismic data plotted a slightly different way. Now it's colored by depth. So all these blues are the deep Pahala earthquakes going on here. Some deep earthquakes hap have happened in the last month, a little bit east of the summit. Interesting, but you know, not alarming. Nothing, you know, there's just some adjustment of some unknown character happening down there, but that's what volcanoes do. Here are some adjustments around the summit. Nothing major happening there. We really don't see anything major happening in any of the rift zones. We do see this this cloud on this patch that's always active here on the south flank, just just past the bend of Mount Ulu in a rift zone where the rift zone bends over here. So uh, it's interesting to see that adjustment um, um, still happening, but it's also become normal. So really, a little bit more to the east as well. Really, nothing unusual happening there. Here's a slightly bigger south flank earthquake there. Okay, move on. Um, this first plot coming down, just to talk, talk through some of these. We're look, you, have, you have to always look at the axis, and we're looking at depth and then latitude, right? So this is just the map, right? So essentially the Pahala earthquakes are deep over here. Here is the one under Kilauea, east of Kilauea summit. And then this band here is the south flank earthquakes that are happening east of the summit essentially is what that is showing us. And looking at the earthquake rates and depths of the past month, it's been pretty steady. Somewhere an average of 15 earthquakes per day with the natural variations up and down, sometimes as low as 5, sometimes as high as 25 or more. But all that has become our new background, our new normal, as this eruption uh, is now 100 days in and certainly classifies as a long-term eruption now. Okay, so there's another plot generated here automatically in this last month, also depth on the left, but now on the x-axis down here we have date. So this is one month ago and today over here. So the Pahala earthquakes have been happening fairly steady the entire time. Maybe it's a little, little, little burst, a little gap, a little burst, a little gap, a little burst. That's sometimes a little bit more. That's what's going on here in this plot. And then if you look at the upper part, the Orange and yellow, that's that, that middle and lower part of the south flank, and the red is that upper part of the south flank. That's, that's what that's, that whole band over here is just showing the south flank is active fairly continuously as well over time. And deformation data, there's that plot we can't read. We'll pass that. Here's our gas data. Since that update was posted, posted this morning, that mentioned 650. There's a 600 line here, 700 line here. We're max at 1,200 tons per day, 300 tons per day over the last month. 650 was a reported March 26th value. There's a new new uh, point on the plot here that looks like it's about 580 or so. It's hard to tell exactly, but that must have been just been taken and put up put up there since the update came in this morning. So that's the interesting trend there. If you look at at since the 19th. And the last time we came out of that deflation, the trend has been a downward one. And it's just a little bit of data, and we'll see the cycles are common here. But interesting to think about whether this might be petering out at some point, and what would that look like if it would look something like this, or if if we're just seeing seeing the variation in the cycle, right? I'm not saying that it is petering out. I'm just saying it's interesting to think about why it might be doing this while it's not showing any major change in the tilt at the same time. Okay, so that's the SO2 emission rates. So we do have ambient air plots that I haven't shown in a while, so I thought I would bring them back around here today. 
So stations around Kilauea Summit, you can see that depending on, on the direction of the wind, you get these, these things spiking. And the values are, you're seeing are around up to 2 ppm in this, in this one station, HRC PK or CPK. And over here, SDH Sandhill, you can see it's spiking closer to 3 ppm values. And depending on the day, you see it comes in and out. So that's, that's the situation around the summit area of Kilauea. Still stuff blowing around. There is one more plot on here. It's showing my negative values, so there's something wrong with the calibration over here. Something's real funky with this instrument, um, but all good there. And all that VOG. And here's our VOG map project from UH Manoa showing those emissions blowing around, right? So the gas values are still down. 650 tons per day is still a massive amount. It's still above what EPA would allow a, a human factory to emit uh, over the course of a whole year, in fact. So it's, it's uh, still a lot of gas. It's just a relative thing. When we're talking volcanoes, it's, it's relatively little compared to what we've seen before. All right, so now we're going to turn to more earthquakes and look at Mauna Loa a little bit, because if we look at our whole earthquakes on, around the whole island map, we see our regular culprits background background around Mauna Kea. Nothing to be alarmed about there. Our Pahala earthquakes ongoing. Kilauea, really not a whole lot happening in the short term over here. So what is new is this cluster over here on the northwest part of Mauna Loa. So let's zoom into it. And you can see there is a summit of Mauna Loa. There is its summit crater, Kua Veo Veo. In the upper southwest rift over here. So there have been earthquakes that have been common underneath the upper southwest rift, underneath the summit caldera, and also in areas northwest of the summit crater over here. So there's nothing too unusual there. Uh, I can show you guys here. It's showing 142 earthquakes for the past week in this particular view. I zoom in a little more and get that one straggler off of the, off of the screen there. That's showing 140 earthquakes in the map area in the past week. So the USGS is reporting over 130 since 2.30 a.m. on the 29th, so that is 36 hours or so. Um, that's the situation there. Um, so cut right to it. They're showing, uh, they put out an information statement that there is an earthquake swarm on the northwest flank, not erupting, and no signs of increased activity is a, is a gist of it. But... Here's where it comes from. At 2.30 a.m. on the 29th, 130 earthquakes beneath the northwest side of Mauna Loa Summit. Most of these are occurring in a cluster about one mile wide and three and a half to five miles below the surface. Okay, below the surface. Mauna Loa's summit is about two and a half miles above the surface, so three and a half to five miles below the surface. 2.7 is the largest, only light shaking by nearby residents. Um, clustering does not mean an eruption is imminent. There are many shallow earthquakes in this area for many decades across several eruptive cycles at both Kilauea and Mauna Loa. These earthquakes may result from changes in the magma storage system and or may be part of normal readjustments to the volcano due to changing stresses within it. So other monitoring data streams show no significant changes in activity. And they keep monitoring. They do reference a 2014 Volcano Watch article, which is this one. Mauna Loa, a stirring giant from 2014, and they, they kind of note that there are areas, those same areas of earthquakes northwest of the summit and north southwest rift and, and summit crater as well. And they do talk about uh, some of those patterns, and so it's worth going and looking at that if you uh, want that level of detail. Uh, but I will scroll down here and just want to point out what they what they what they say is why this is happening, which maybe is what, what you're mostly interested in. Mauna Loa consists of a hot and plastic core that is composed of overlapping dikes intruded during the construction of the volcano's edifice. Stresses arising from an intrusion of magma or gases under the volcano may be transmitted through the mushy core to the cooler, cooler and more brittle crust outside the core of the volcano. Alright, that's the gist of it right in there. So this volcano has is, is got a big mushy core to it that's a series of dikes and sills that blades that go in different directions and also also horizontally and 
there, there's interconnectivity. And as pressure is building in part, one part of the volcano, that pressure is going to redistribute through those pathways to other parts of the volcano. When it does that, it's going to squeeze against the wall rock outside of the mushy core in slightly different places. And that's what causes the earthquakes. So it is magma moving, yes. Is it, is it a concern? Uh, not necessarily. It, I mean, it could be magma move, moved already, and now it's just just the pressure wave is finally propagating to cause the earthquakes to happen. You know, it may, it may have happened already in the past. So it's not, that's why they say that it may be the it may be the adjustment of the uh, of the crust to the forces or the movement of magma and gases through the volcano, right? But that's what the volcano does, and that's the that, that's how it maintains itself. Uh, much of the magma that moves and forms the volcano is injected underground in these kind of structures without actually having to erupt at the surface. So what we really care about as humans is will it come to the surface and erupt. And as far as that goes, there's no increased signs of that, right? And we can turn turn once again. I'll show you guys here from the USGS monitoring page. I drew this earthquake plot around the, the instruments here and showed you guys here. Minus 2.5 is the summit of the volcano. So this is a, this is a surface up here. Sea level. And here is our cluster of earthquakes that's happening in the last 36 hours or so. And with the red ones being the, the most current ones when I made this plot. And you can see that, yeah, maybe a half mile underground, so three miles below the surface. Three and a half miles below the surface, maybe even to five miles, miles below the surface. That's the range of where this is. And it's that, it's that outer brittle rock that surrounds that mushy core. And that's how it moves and gives. And that doesn't mean anything as far as it is going towards some eruption. That's just something that we can see in detail now because we have all the monitoring instruments and we are all watching. We are all hyper aware and hypersensitive. So I do, I do realize that, uh, that uh, any little change in activity might make us jumpy, but that's what the volcano does, and what we're really looking for is a change in a background rate of earthquakes over time, right? So let's look at how, how these earthquakes look um, on overall overall trends, but let's just check in with a tilt and GPS real quick first. So our summit tilt is showing a little deviation here in the last 36 hours, right? It's it's actually only from minus 1.5 to zero, one and a half microradians total. But it's not happening right underneath it, so it's off to the side, perhaps, from this station, and fairly minor surface effect that you can see there. It's certainly nothing very quick or very big, like you would expect building up to an eruption. Uh, no sign of that there. And to look at the past month, that's that signal right over here. It's still getting blown out by the shaking of an earthquake that happened three weeks or so ago. Okay, so going down to the GPS, the GPS is showing something interesting here. We've seen where it looks like we may have some lower values clustering. Once again, the same caveats about that right hand side of this GPS graph. This data can get reviewed and adjusted, but it may be that we're seeing a slightly different pattern of, of magma moving within the volcano towards moving more in that northwest area on the other side of the crater, which would push the crater closed together, which is what we saw happened uh, based on the GPS plots presented by Frank Truesdell over here starting in October. So that's something that may be happening again. About $5 super chat from Two Pineapples says, Mahalo, uh, appreciate the stream and all your knowledge. Thank mahalo, you. Mahalo, Pineapples. Yeah, so we may be seeing another one of these little dips happening. It may, it may dip down again before it comes back up. And how long that lasts, if it's going to be this same length where it lasts months and months, or something small, smaller, like we've seen little dips happen before over time. And this is just the past uh, the past year here. We can scroll down. There's a whole past five years. It's not as easy to tell. But you can tell that there's little deviations, little little wiggles that happen happen within there as well. So certainly it's one of the bigger ones and we're seeing that volcano is adjusting more frequently and uh, in a larger fashion than we've seen um, recently, right? But that, so, you know, we're, we are all preparing ourselves for the time when Mauna Loa does erupt in the future. It's not a matter of if it erupts again, but when. Um, but when it erupts, it's going to go through uh, a sequence that we expect to start at the summit and over some course of time give us signals of where it would go from there. And then, once it does that, then we'll have 
uh, different levels of concern based on which direction it's flowing. And there's many places it could flow where it doesn't actually impact people that much. So that's most of the area, in fact, is, is like that. Um, so we have to wait and see and not jump the gun on Mauna Loa, even though there is a lot of adjustment happening there. Right. We don't think Mauna Loa is going to be a big sneaky and just, you know, come up one night when we're, nobody's expecting it out of the blue type of thing. It's going to be pretty uh, pretty yeah. clear on, oh, it's waking up. Like, Look at it. Uh, we have 500 earthquakes today or right. something like that. Right, exactly. Yeah. So speaking of earthquake rates, that's what we'll look at here next. And earthquakes per week, week is what's shown on this past year plot. So you can see it's just earthquakes per week, the, the trends. Sometimes up, you know, we have a sawtooth pattern, it goes up and down, up and down. Sometimes it peaks where it's peaked close to 200 before. We're having the highest peak here in the last year that was at 250. And it trended downwards. We had a little bit of a gap here. And now we're popping back up again at the right end of this graph and zoom in so you guys can see it. And so there was a little, little bit of a, of, a, of a lull here, but even then it was still coming into that level of 50 earthquakes per week, just a little bit slower than normal. And I'm going to address that here shortly, but let's look at it another way first. And that's looking at the earthquake rates for the past month here. So earthquakes per day. The plot looks different because our scale is different. Earthquakes per day now, and we're going up to 120. And so we can see that our plot today, we are at over 100 earthquakes per day on this, on this particular bin. And there's the other 40 yesterday. Okay, we're here on the side. There's our 140 earthquakes uh, for this particular cluster. And there was a little bit of a slowdown beforehand. And I didn't mean to cause any alarm you know, by saying that you know, sometimes it's a little bit worrying when, thing, when things stop when earthquakes stop all the way, right? Because uh, we did see that before the 2018 eruption. But what that often tells you is that the ground is able to move without having to break and cause the earthquakes at that point in time. And that usually doesn't last long, as you saw right here. It, it just transferred. It was able to essentially was transferring a stress from where the earthquakes were happening elsewhere and moving that force and pressure across the volcano to where it was able to have that, that pop on the northwest side now. Right, most of these other other earthquakes, the last earthquake pop we saw was on the northeast side, and so it's kind of it's it's a different side of the volcano here. It's not doing it all in the same place. It's moving itself around. So, but certainly the ground is able to move once in a while without without cracking, and that's what we look at the GPS for. And then when you look at the GPS, you see it's actually actually a summit's contracting, and so um, something happening outside the summit zone to the north of the summit right now. And still, hundred earthquakes per day. Right? It might seem like a lot, even if it was 140 altogether, add them all up together. Right? Most of these are still down below this 20 range. And just to refresh you guys before we take our first break here, uh, here's a 1975 eruption. And earthquakes per day, this is 500, this is 1,000, this is 1,500. So our activity corresponds to what you see right over here, this kind of thing. So maybe, maybe we're seeing this first little peak. Right? But we have to see it go up and do that again over and over and over and get to 500 and then do 100 and then do 500 and then one day it's going to go to 1,000, 1,500 and then we'll say, okay, um, that's, that's a whole next, we're now no longer in third gear for this volcano or we're shifting, shifting and shifting and let's see, let's see how quickly it, it takes, right? Uh, here in the bottom of this plot you can see days, right? So uh, zero on the left. And around 50 is when this little peak happens, and so 400 days later, in 1975, was when this eruption actually happened. So it was over a year later. So a long build-up. These things been up for a long, long time. And so you can see it was most of a whole year where you were having no less than, let's call it 50 earthquakes per day, every single day for all year. And you had peaks that were going up to 500, and a few hundred, and once in a while to 1,500. A thousand, right? And look at this this section right before the eruption. The whole whole base background is going up to where the background now becomes 500 earthquakes per day every day, right? From this point on, for the last two months, 500 earthquakes per day for two months before it actually popped. So it's, yeah, it's not going to sneak up, it's, you know. So yeah, we can maybe see something like this as a sign of maybe some more stuff to come. But just because we see this doesn't mean we can expect all that to come. 
right away as well. It's always been a matter of time, right? In fact, this Volcano Watch we just showed you guys briefly back from 2014 says Mauna Loa could be reawakening in 2014, seven years ago, and it's still slowly building to reawaken. Still hasn't finished waking up all the way, right? As far as producing lava on the surface. But certainly she's stirring inside, and that's okay. All right, so that concludes our first part of our of our update. We'll have just, have just one one shorter segment afterwards to talk about uh, our eruption rates here in Kilauea based on the uh, eruption maps and USGS updates here. So, but before that, we'll uh, say our thank yous, our mahalos, and right. see if we can address some questions. Yeah, we do have a bunch of people to thank today. I want to get through that kind of quickly. We do want to thank uh, Kaleo's Bar and Grill for being a sponsor. They have a really unique experience in Bahoa. If you're ever out this side and want some quality, uh, affordable food, that is the place to check out. Always a good uh, option there. Uh, indoor, outdoor seating, COVID safe, all that fun stuff. But really uh, great, great service, great food, great environment. So yeah, definitely check them out. Uh, second one we have going is uh, Kalani Tours, uh, Experience Hawaii. The, they offer uh, several different tour packages, including the National Park and the Coffee Farms of Kona, take you to some more of the iconic uh, waterfalls around the island. And it's always good to, especially for people that aren't familiar with the area, to go with a guide of some kind to prevent uh be, you know, from walking into things that are unexpected to you, but known to residents, it's more common than you might think. Um, but yeah, we're really glad to have them as uh, official sponsors of us. And with that, we do want to recognize some people, uh, some of the donations that we've had. We had two pineapples in the super chat on YouTube. We appreciate that. But also, we do take donations on hawaiitracker.com slash uh, slash support. And the, what we have uh, five donations there. Really like to thank them. Uh, Marcus N, uh, Kenrin G, Janet K, D and D M, and Craig L. Uh, really appreciate the support there. And with that, I believe we can get into some of the questions. Mahalo, you guys. All right, so. There's a lot of questions about Mauna Loa, first and foremost. Um, but before we do that, uh, I, there is one question I kind of kind of phone in here. Um, where do you expect, if there were to be an eruption on Mauna Loa, where would the most likely place for it to occur, at least in the beginning? The summit, yeah. Right. Yeah. The summit. Um, all right, so Hawaiian Homestead asks, uh, while we may not, we don't need it currently at the moment with the SO2 that we do have, what is the best mass uh, for SO2 levels that uh, are used uh, commonly? Like what, what do we use in 2018? Um, you want to take that one or should I? Yeah, go ahead, take it. Yeah, that we're using the... Uh, the half face respirators. You want the, the SO2 specific ones. Normal respirators aren't going to do it. The 3M 609, uh, 6009 series is good. You know, the basically the ones also that have the the pink filters. Those are generally going to work as well. Um, and it was there was a lot of people using the wrong filters in 2018 that we found that it would get worked out over time. But I'm sure that would happen again uh, come the next eruption where it matters. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, it's really all about the filters and, and making sure that you look at which, whichever brand, different brands, and have different shapes and, and colors. But as long as it says SO2 on on that cartridge, then you're good to go. And those cartridges don't last forever, so they need to be, need to be fairly fresh. And you can have them in in the packaging and then leave it to open when you need it. And then you open it and you can right. install them at the time and then kind of go from there. And depending how close or how how you know how how much the wind blows vog in your direction, which you know you may have some idea based on what Kilauea has done, but it might be different from Mauna Loa. It's hard to tell. Um, there, ha there were people, people at the time who were wearing goggles or full face masks that were covering the eyes as well to protect the eyes from mm -hmm. any of that any of that burning gas as well. Especially if you're having to go in and out of the eruption zone to 
evacuate or monitor or whatever for whatever reason it was that was something that was valuable as well as something that could cover the eyes but if you you know in the worst case you could just put on some swim goggles if it came down to it just something that's airtight um, all right we did have a question from uh kalana on youtube asking about uh the role in earthquake activity on Mauna Loa before this recent uptick so you were saying in the presentation about that part that it kind of loaded up and transferred the pressure to a different spot for to, for these earthquakes is that basically it yeah so uh i'm trying, I'm trying to read, read the question here um the earthquake swarm so i mean yeah it's it's there's a boundary between Kilauea and Mauna Loa that's one zone of adjustment that's the Kauriki area and there's an area of adjustment that's west of Mauna Loa an area of adjustment that's north of Mauna Loa so Mauna Loa can can adjust Kilauea is doing its thing so it also is changing the the balance you know at, at on its side of the boundary but Mauna Loa is also doing the same too so Kauriki is could be ambiguous sometimes um it mm. often goes with Kilauea but uh it, it could also go from Mauna Loa Right. Um, um, so, so yeah, it's a, in, in that sense, Mauna Loa is pushing to the point where it also is putting pressure for sure, unambiguously on an area Northwest of its summit crater, right? It's something that it's, cannot be Kilauea doing it over there. And right? so Mauna Loa is definitely mm -hmm. pushing from its side as well. And so you're, you're kind of, kind of seeing it there. Yeah. And so ha yeah, having a lone earthquakes, I mean, it's, uh, it it it, dep it depends really what what the low actually is, right? And you have to remember how these how the maps you might see online are counted, and sometimes some of the automatic daily and monthly maps are are have a lower threshold, so you can see those zero point two is point three is that tell you that stuff is actually happening and not dead dead, because when it's dead dead, that's what I worry about when you don't even have a magnitude zero point ones, right? That's right. when it, that's when it seems like you're you're stressed to the point where the, you're about to burst, like the burst is coming kind of thing. We're nowhere near that, right? When, when we saw that happen in 2018 on Kilauea, that was after months and months of earthquakes in the Upper East Rift Zone and lava like overflowing three times. And it was 10 years of lava column rise. I mean, there, there was a whole lot more going on than just that, right? So it was when all that activity that had been happening for 10 years, when all that went dead quiet, then we were like, okay, well, what's what's gonna give something's gonna give it seems like and then the sequence began yeah shortly afterwards right so we don't have that pattern here because we don't have that that stuff happening beforehand that giant activity for for years and years and years so yeah so um, right. that's that's you know yeah, that's that's part of it and so you know and also the fact that that having lows and peaks is normal because that is how you know it's adjust is you know you sometimes you can you can't adjust some parts of the volcano without having to cause earthquakes and then you just keep moving 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 and suddenly oh here's where it catches so that's where you have to push and cause the earthquakes to go so that's that's, that's how i think right. of it the, pr the pressure being redistributed right from a smaller area to a larger area all around and wherever it has to catch and move whatever the sticky spot is that's where you're going to have the earthquakes come in and that's why those areas seem to repeat those earthquake patterns over and over and over again in the same places all right Next question is from Lisa on Facebook, and I'm going to just uh, start it off for you, and then you can take it from there. Um, she asks about uh, where residents should take shelter if Mauna Loa were to erupt, and uh, flow. where would it flow? So one of the ways that I've always described Mauna Loa is being essentially a roulette wheel in terms of how it impacting human life, where red doesn't hit doesn't impact anything black maybe it uh, lightly impacts something but green is the one that you're really looking out for those those where it's very specifically uh, has a certain type of eruption to it and those are the ones that are gonna you know impact uh maybe ocean view or the west side of south kona but the in general, there's Mauna Loa is so big that it could easily erupt go into the rift zone uh, erupt for 100 days and touch really nothing, maybe a small access road of some kind. But the, the, those types of eruptions are very uh, possible there. Yeah, and so the, yeah, Bonalo is a very big volcano, and 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 there are also um, uh, response maps that the U.S. Justice prepared 
depending on which section of the summit or of which rift zone would, would erupt, there would be very small areas affected. Because the slopes are so steep, it does kind of keep the flows shooting down, you know, shooting down on one smaller area rather than spreading out all over the place. So it really depends on where it comes down, right? You really only have to go a short distance laterally to get out of that little lava shed that you would be in to get to the next one over to shelter over there. And so really, there it's you know somewhere it's close by, and you know, it, it depends where, right? You know, each each of those areas, each community should be should have some gathering plan in place, right? right? So maybe if you're in Ocean View, the, the community center, for example, would be, might be where you might go, or. I don't know, right. um, but that's something along those lines, right? And if you know, if you had to go out of Ocean View, then maybe you go east, and everyone meets in Waiohiku or something. I don't know. I don't know. There's a, some. There's a different way that you have to, you know. Um, it depends right. where it comes no out way. and where you might get affected, and that's the worst worst case. Most of the time, it's going to start high up, and it's going to going to be something we see when and say, okay, well, here is where the area is in threat. Then the next area in threat is this one. You're, you guys are in a clear. Then the next area in threat, you guys are in a clear, and it's going to progress something like that, right? But we do have a bunch of maps, and it, is, it isn't it is going to be like all of South Kona go all at once. Right. Might, it, that what, might be what happens, but... Right. And it does like to seem to do those long... When it does get to the South Kona uh, and reach the ocean, it likes to do those long runs, those long skinny runs, as opposed to the where you'd see on the more flat land that spread out like in uh, 2014 uh, in Pahoa where we just get wide flows and uh, on this gradual land, those Mauna Loa flows come down steep and uh, pretty sharp. All right. So one of the questions on YouTube is about, um, we I think you already touched upon it, but um, the earthquakes that do and don't show up on Mauna Loa, um, the thresholds that some people are experiencing on the, Jennifer asked, the EQ swarm on the, Northeast Rift Zone, earlier this month, doesn't seem to show on the Mauna Loa maps you're looking at. Why is that? Are they counted on other maps? Yeah, so th those, uh, let me see if I can find the exact thing that she's talking about so I can explain it better to you guys. All right, so this, when we're looking at this page, which is the USGS monitoring page for the past month for Mauna Loa, and it has this automatic map right here. It just has these boundaries that they've defined to be the boundary of what, what they consider, consider the Mauna Loa summit bucket, essentially. So then it tells us here, 704 earthquakes. It tells us the dates. Right, but this is all all size earthquakes, right, including... Um, ones that fall in a magnitude zero range little dots in there right? um so it's the number of earthquakes in this area is what's plotting on these maps right here so that northeast east flank zone isn't going to be on this particular map you would have to go to the uh let's, you'd have to go to this usgs map and now I have to go to my layers settings here, and I have to go back beyond seven days. I will turn on 30 days all magnitudes for the US. That out of there. So, I do like how they uh, expanded that uh, site to include the 30 days all magnitudes. I think before it was, uh, they had a threshold on it. Yeah, well, yeah, it was a, yeah there was a 2.5 magnitude, yeah, threshold, yeah. right? So not, now those ones that are ordered in a week, but less than a month are coming in in white, right? So here's here's our our uh, northeast flank cluster. Here's our current cluster northwest, and you can see there's also been some summit activity and upper southwest rift. That's the normal background that we that we have. So all that is it's it's still there. It's not as easy to find, right? If I zoom into just this one over here, then I can still look at this cluster and sort it by by event or pick out certain certain individual individual events and look at them in detail. Right, so that's how that works. Oh, right. Yeah, that's always there's always so many caveats with the the earthquakes, and then you start talking about Pahala earthquakes, and it just adds a whole new layer of complexity to it. Um, 
Yeah, yeah, and the Pahala, the, the Pahala Earthquake Zone, there is a, a, a portion of it that falls in the map for Kilauea's automatic earthquake bucket. So when you look at Kilauea's earthquake counts, it does catch a piece of that Pahala thing also. So sometimes you have to try to filter that signal from whatever else is happening on Kilauea. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. well. Why the, that's why it's good to have the seismologists here and, uh, you know, so experienced at what they do to be able to interpret these things on the fly. Yeah, um, I mean, these, yeah, I mean, these are, these are map maps that were determined to be useful um, for the public, you know, um, but they really haven't changed, to be honest, in over a decade yeah, on yeah. the USGS website. So that's... There's, they have their share of uh, legacy programs and protocols up there. Yeah, yeah, they do, ha they do have their own monitoring web interface, but it's really uh, can be quite frustrating to use. So that's mm -hmm. why I typically show you show the other earthquake page. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, I believe that does it for our first round of questions. We do have we'll end with this one. Um, Terry Davis asks a little more meta question on uh, did Kilauea start as a seamount or did it start on the side of uh, the other volcanoes and just built off of them? Yeah, it seems like it seems like Mauna Loa for sure was here before. So the first one that was a seamount by itself was probably Mavukona off to the northwest and Kohala might have joined it and then Mauna Kea might have joined it and Hualalai and Mauna Loa and then Kilauea all joined it. Just like Louis, he may join the party here and be the next next one. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, so yeah, it's not it's not, not, it's not, not a super long uh, little extra section we have here, so we'll see if we get to get to any other questions. If you guys have them, we'll take them and if not, right. we'll just wrap it up here at the end. But just just a little bit of following up, and this is actually a question that we, that we had uh, last week that I wanted to make sure we followed up on here, and so I'll show you guys. Start off with this. This is the most recent uh, summit map put out by the USGS. This is March 29th. You can't see it behind me over here, but it says March 29th. And it gives uh, a little bit more detail. So if I can zoom in and show you guys here. We're now, sh now showing all the small little islands as well. We're showing the north vent. We're showing the small islets within a current active lake over here as well, within there, in little, little yellow spots. There and there and there, right? You see that little the little peninsula part of the west vent in here. So all, all that stuff's getting updated. And you still have those old lava levels of how high it has to come to spill out of that innermost crater and then higher to get out of that other crater and then higher to get out of that whole other crater. But, before we can even talk about what the same lava levels as what was happening happening 100 years ago, spilling out of the caldera, getting close to that. So we're still way, way down there, um, still out of sight, unfortunately. Um, but one interesting thing about these maps is that they also have, you scroll here to the side, they also quite often have statistics. So well, it's going to reload it for me. Thank you. So it actually tells us statistics through March 29th. It'll tell us the surface. 741 meters, 2431 feet above sea level. It'll tell us the depth surface to bottom, because the crater doesn't go all the way down to sea level. It'll tell us active lake area now at 8 acres. And it'll tell us the total lake area at 109 acres. And that's the whole area of, of lava flow of the last 100 days. And it also tells us total lake volume, 39 million cubic meters or 10 million gallons. And we're getting a little bit more resolution in a million cubic meters. We're getting a little bit more resolution on the acres over here and here. So what I've done is tabulated volume in cubic meters, volume in, or uh, area in acres, and uh, the volume change rate change based on series of these maps because we now have these maps going back for 100 days. And we also have some of the early USGS daily updates. We're giving estimates. And so some of those estimates are, are pretty rough. Um, but you know, here's an example of the last one, March 12th, where we had slightly different an active lake area of 13 acres that was, it's now down to eight. We've lost five acres, right? We've lost one third of our area almost in the last two weeks here. And so a uh, little area, 38 million cubic meters. And so I'll cut, cut to the chase with, with us here and show you guys this plot. I hope this will load here. Where are you? There you are. All right, so this is four different lines on here. And so the red one 
is the volume in million cubic meters, and it's the only one that's got the, the scale on the right over here. So we're up to, right now, 39 million cubic meters. Um, the total area is this orange line right in here. It's up to 100 and, what was it, 109 as well. Um, let's see what it says here. Maybe. Hundred and six, hundred nine, hundred and nine acres right there. And you can see we go to the green line next. The green line is the active area. I mean, so there was a point right here. There was a inflection point. It was right around January eighth or so, right when we had that whole crusting over of the whole eastern side of the lava lake. Yeah, and uh, what you can see is from that point on the active area split and has been going down steadily ever since the point where now we're at the all-time low for this eruption of eight acres of active lava surface area right over here the blue line is the one we've been trying to get at is the actual volume rate right so it's not exactly the eruption rate it's the rate of the change of the volume which can be due to degassing and it can be due, be due to the eruption rate as well um but so it's the closest thing we have based on on, on those estimates and there's Certainly some error, especially as early numbers, you know, um, especially as they don't don't report things in much detail. And we're just getting 39, you know, 3.9 times 10 to the 7. We're only getting two significant digits there of, of information. So it's not, a, not as accurate as they can put out at some point. We'd like to see that. But so preliminarily, preliminarily, we can see that our eruption rate, the volume, peaked to maybe around 90, maybe not quite 100, but in that range. 90 to 100 cubic meters per second that was in the first week before we crashed back down pretty quick and there's some little variations i'm not sure if those are real or if they have to do with the, the reporting and the sampling or if they're you know some other little factors i don't like like i said usgs's plot would be better when you produce one and, and show us but what you basically can take away from it is that it's been pretty low and going down ever since then to the point where you know we've had you know still still in december we're still having some values that are around 10 cubic meters per second for example right uh, we had a value over here in early february that was close to close to six cubic meters per second and we had a three there was some deflation inflation events where the actual depth wasn't changing and the volume wasn't changing apparently because you're putting lava in and, and losing gas out and it was a net nothing so it actually shows us a zero. So it's, you know that shows some of the, the failures of this process right in here, but still pretty low. And based on that analysis, to one significant figure, we are right now at zero point seven cubic meters per second here at the right end of this graph. Right, zero point seven cubic meters per second, which is not a whole lot at all. I mean, it's we're talking about the about the pool oil era eruption rate. It might have gotten down as low as two sometimes, you know, there were times where it was, you know, it might have been four for the corruption up to perhaps in a range of five or six, you know, for some some spurts of it. Right, you know, uh, the eruption um, happening in Iceland now is in a range of like five to seven, for example, right, you know, um, gives you some idea, you know, when I can't even mention Etna because it just blows us out of the water over here, but we will look at some of these historical figures and look at Etna there as well. But that's the bottom line here is that you know you can see that we've we've gone down 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 and you guys are wondering what the eruption eruption rate is it's not exactly this but it's it has some bearing on, on the shape of this graph right here so essentially it's been going down at a slow rate ever since ever since uh january or so right so that's the that's the plot there and um, we Several months ago now, I showed this plot here as a, you know one of the, the different patterns of how volcanoes can have these kind of plots be right. You know, the eruption rate is something that changes over time, so such that you could have a high eruption rate and it can go down and end, or tail off longer. Or this we seem to have fallen squarely in this category C, where it went up high, it came down quick, and we've had a long drawn out tail to it. And right? so in the end, C was the winner. Of how our eruption tended to be. So our eruption rate started off high, but as time went on, it averaged itself down 
to where now we're probably fairly low for the whole eruption as a whole because we're going on so long at this low eruption rate now. That's one interesting aspect of it. There are plots. Dane? Yep, we have a $15 donation from Brian Bielman. Uh, no comment. Appreciate it. Mahalo. Mahalo, Brian. So here, uh, this is a table of historic eruption rates. Right? And so that's the value that's over here in this column. It's probably hard for you guys to read as a reference. There's other uh, duration and year and period of activity here, right? But I'll, I'll just kind of scan down here. <clears throat> uh, 180, you know, sorry, sorry, I'm in the wrong column. Um, 81, 2.1, we had a 0 0.2 for only 11 days. 1.8, 9.3, 6.8, 3, 5, 2, 3, 18, 26, 30. There's a 0 0.7 for one third of a day eruption. There's a 0 0.1 for a 22 day eruption in the 1960s. And so the range of Kilauea is, is usually kind of low, but not always under one, right? There's not, not a whole lot of these that end up being under one. Right, not that we would, would be under one for a whole eruption as a whole either, right? But uh, you can kind of see see the range right here: twenty, thirty. You know, sometimes in nineteen seventy one, two hundred and forty. Right, nineteen seventy four, four hundred and thirty. And so we do get into the hundreds. Right? These are, that, that was these are usually short eruptions. We're getting into the hundreds there. And that's what what made, what made two thousand eighteen, which is not on this. this is, it's too young young for this publication. Uh, such a such a high rate really blows all these out of the water, and so that's that's essentially um, it. Mauna Loa, you can see, is usually in the tens and does get to the hundreds as well, but rarely is it under ten. There's only a handful of times where it ends up coming in under ten cubic meters a second. So that's why we think of Mauna Loa as being one whole order of magnitude scale larger with its flows than Kilauea on average. Certainly, we can range to the Kilauea range, right? There's a 2.5, right? There's a 15. But a lot of times, it's you see a lot more of these 20, 40, 50, 60, 90 um, values than you do on Kilauea. And yeah, that's that's what we have to say on the eruption rates here. Just a little little add-on to follow up on a question that was asked by by a viewer here about a week ago or so. Right, and it doesn't look like we have any more real questions uh, coming in. Um, well, mahalo, everybody. Yeah, yeah. The, we have one is, does Hawaii have uh, dead volcanoes? Uh, it, yeah, I mean, that, this, this island has volcanoes that are considered extinct, which means that they don't have intact magma systems within them but that doesn't mean that they won't erupt again through some other process of magma under the crust underneath there right um there is a there is a, a piece of the island that's submerged offshore called mahukona volcano right and um you know, that that one might be the one that's the most extinct perhaps of all of them that makes part of that, this landmass of, of hawaii island all right. Well, that does it for the questions. Uh, appreciate the time, everybody, that, everybody that showed up in the chat. Um, until next time, we will be going live Friday again. Mahalo, Phil. Yeah, mahalo, Dane. And mahalo, everybody. Thanks for the questions. Thanks, everyone, for your support. We'll see you guys on Friday. Aloha.